Good morning. Welcome, everybody, at West Side Alliance Church. We are going to get started here. I'm going to read from Psalm 100, Psalm of Praise. Hopefully this will uh, help us to fix our eyes on God and pre be prepared to worship Him this morning. Psalm 100 says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Join with me in prayer. God, thank you that you are good. You are faithful. These are things that we can count upon in this evil world full of wickedness, and we thank you for being steady, being a rock, being the ultimate source of truth and reality. You are creator God. You created this whole world and everything in it. All of the people in this world, those were your idea that we would be in relationship with you. As we worship you this morning, God, help us to draw near to you in a full sense of faith that you are and that you reward, reward those who seek you. We thank you for your goodness this morning, Lord. And as we sing, help us to sing from our hearts, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, Dan. Good morning, Westside Alliance family. I invite you to stand with us. We are going to have the privilege of singing about the goodness of God now together. Uh, I think we're just waiting for those lyrics, but this is Goodness of God, I Love You, Lord. If you guys remember that one. Here we go. I love you, Lord. For your mercy never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. I will sing of the goodness of God all my life.
will see the goodness of you said though the storms may come and the winds may blow I'll remain steadfast and let my heart learn when you speak a word it will come to pass great is your faith Jesus, thank you so much that we can trust that what you say is true, that you are faithful to your word, that you are faithful to your promises, and you are the rock on which you are building your church, God. 
We thank you that your word is clear to us, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And in God, we find that uh, comfort, we find peace, and we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning again. Welcome, Westside Alliance family. It's good to praise Jesus with all of you. Um, just a couple of announcements this morning. The first one being that we're continuing our foundations series. And Wendy uh, has started us off in Haggai, rebuilding the foundations. And um, Pastor Jim's going to be leading in the word this morning as well and talking about what is the church. And we'll continue on with our series for the next couple of weeks. So uh, we will be continuing on with foundations. Um, looking at some of the core bedrock things of the church and our faith. And um, second announcement is the annual meeting. So if you are a member here at Westside Alliance Church, we are meeting, and even if you're not a member, you can attend, you just can't vote, but um, we're meeting on February 6th. So um, please come and be prepared to hear and look back over the last year of some things that God has been doing and take some time to pray together and hear some reports of uh, different ministry leaders and just celebrate and also just, God, what have you been doing? What are you doing? And, um, and then um, in prayer and seeking God in that too. So annual meeting February 6th. Am I missing some other announcements here? Okay, Cleveland United in Prayer is an opportunity for the church across Cleveland to seek God in prayer, if that's something that you uh, want to be a part of. Any other announcements I'm missing? Okay, and then the Alliance has initiated this 40 days of prayer opportunity, and if that's something you want to be a part of, sign up for it in the weekly emails. We'll send you some information on that. Um, and it's, it's included in the emails that you get if you already received those. If you are new here, don't see a lot of new people, but uh, feel free to write a prayer request. If you have a prayer request, and this isn't just for adults, kids, if you have a prayer request that you want to write down or have uh, your mom or dad write down on the, uh, the cards here in the back of the pews, they look like this, welcome cards. Feel free to write a prayer request down there, and we'd love to be able to pray with and for you um, for those at our staff meetings during the week. So those are our announcements. Let's keep singing and offering our praise to God. All right. I invite you to stand again. We're going to sing that new song again, Build Your Church, um, very much in line with this series on uh, foundations. <clears throat> I just want to sing this part. It feels like it's a little tricky because of the way that they wrote the words and where they fall. So just repeat after me a little bit. Build your church, build your church, build it from the ground up. It's your church. So you just want to go for the ground and then you'll get the, you'll get it. Okay, let's sing it together. Build your church, Build your church, build it from the ground up, it's your church. Build your church, build your church, build it from the ground up, it's your church. Cool. We're going to start from the beginning. On Christ alone, our chief core stone no other foundation can we build upon not philosophy nor the wisdom of men for all of the ground is sinking sand this part upon this rock 
go. Build your church, build your church, build it from the ground up. It's your church, build your church, build your church, build it from the ground.
thank you that we can trust that it is well, that it is well with our soul because you told us you would never leave us or forsake us. God, we thank you for this time this morning. Continue to minister to our hearts as we hear from your word. Amen. Dren, I think you need to be dismissed up to kids' church as well. Have a great time. Great having the kids worship with us as well, and great to have all of you here this morning to honor the Lord. Thank you for being here. Uh, Many of you know that uh, my name is Jim, Jim Garber. This is my wife, Linda. Some of you might wonder, what is this guy doing here? Why is he here? And uh, let me just say to you, we're kind of in transition in our lives. We retired. I retired from full-time ministry at the end of May, and uh, after 44 years of serving in mostly music ministry role, but also some other uh, roles in pastoral uh, leadership. And we're in transition. We're actually going to be moving back to uh, Warren, Ohio, which is uh, about, yes, Warren. Somebody, I told somebody I was moving back to Warren, and they knew of it, and they said, Warren, what are you going back there for? (laughs) What in the world are you thinking? But that's where our grandkids are and our family, and so we're uh, getting ready to transition here in just a, a, a month or two. But in, these, in this season, we just wanted to come alongside you and help support you as a church family, and uh, so that's kind of what we're doing here. So thank you so much for your welcome to us, and just know that we, we don't know you well, obviously, all of you, but we pray for you, and we're trusting God for you and what God would want to do in this place at Westside, because he's a good God, and he really loves us, and he cares about every aspect of our lives. So thank you for being here today. I think many of you know the name of Vince Lombardi. If you don't, he was the legendary coach of the Green Bay Packers in the 1960s. And the story is told that on one particular game that the Packers were playing, uh, he gave this halftime speech because they had just played a terrible half of football They were being beaten badly, and it's reported that in the locker room they expected that they were going to be reamed out pretty good, but Vince Lombardi simply grabbed a football, and he held it up before them and said, gentlemen, this is a football. Now, the object of this game is to get this football across our opponent's goal line and to prevent them from doing the same to us. Now, men, if we're going to accomplish this, we have to do two fundamental things. We have to block and we have to tackle. And so he took two of the players and he had them demonstrate the proper technique right there in the locker room of blocking and tackling. Can you imagine a professional football coach saying to a professional football player, this is a football? (laughs) Uh, That would be like talking to a mechanic and saying, this is a wrench, or talking to a, a chef and saying, this is a frying pan. Or let's put it in terms I understand, I'm a piano player. Uh, The piano has white keys and black keys. Uh Uh-huh, I know. But what he was trying to tell his team was, look, guys, what you're doing out there, I know you're football players, but what you're doing out there doesn't look like the game of football the way it's supposed to be played. You're not doing something fundamental. And I wonder, as I was thinking about that story, if the Lord would even say to us today, church, what are you doing? I have some fundamental things that I want you to do. And you may not be doing those. (laughs) I may not be doing those. You may not be living out. What is the church then? Not necessarily church the way I grew up in church or the way you grew up in church, because what happens if we grew up with traditions that really aren't (laughs) what God wants for the church? See, we're going to look today at what is the church? What does God want for his church? This is his idea. This is not a human institution. It's not run by human, I mean, it's obviously managed by human beings, but 
God said that the church belongs to him. It's Jesus' church, right? So what is the church? What is his intentions for the church? That's what we're going to talk about today. Thanks for, for going on this journey with me today. Let me just pray for us real quick. Lord, no matter what endeavor it is, uh, Vince Lombardi had to talk to his men about the way they were playing the game of football, and I pray that you would just talk to us today about the way we do church, what your church is all about, because ultimately, God, we have to get our signals from you. So I just pray for an openness of, of spirit and heart today. I pray that you help me as I speak to the people today. I pray that it would be much more than just an educational thing or give them more information, but far beyond that, I, I pray that you'll meet with us and help us and help us to know how to better serve you and what your church is to be like. Thank you for this church. Thank you for Westside Church. And we invite you just to speak to our hearts as, as your word is proclaimed today. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. When the New Testament talks about the church, I think you know this, it's never referring to a building, right? I think everybody knows that. We use things like, uh, we say, I'm going to church, or are you going to church today? Now, that's just a convenient way of saying, are we going to the place where the church is meeting? Because the church is not a building, the church is an assembly of people who have been called out by God. In fact, that's the definition of the church. The most common word translated church in the New Testament is the Greek word ekklesia, ekklesia, which means a called out group. God calls out. So George Partington says the root idea of the church is that of a company of believers called out from the world to belong to Christ and be indwelt by the Spirit of God. So we're going to unpack that together, and we're going to focus on three words. I used alliteration. Forgive me, preachers always use words that, of alliteration, okay? So I'm throwing three at you today, hopefully that they'll stick with you a little bit better. But there's three words that I want to use to answer the question, what is the church? And those three words are simply confession, commands, commission. Can you remember that? If somebody this afternoon would ask somebody that was here, what were those three words? I hope you can say confession, commands, and commission. What I mean by that, confession, the church is about a confession. It's a collection of people who hold to a great confession about the person and work of Jesus Christ, okay? You can't have a church that isn't centered on Jesus Christ. If, you, if you're not centered on Jesus Christ, I don't care what you call it. It's what, whatever label you put on an empty bottle, it doesn't matter. The church is Jesus Christ, who he is, what he has done. It's centered and all about him, okay? Commands is the second word. The church is a collection of people who are willing to repent from sin so that they may be obedient to Jesus' commands. That's the church. God does not want us to become Christians and then live any way we want. No, no, no. We're people who repent from sin and follow Jesus Christ and follow his commands. We're going to unpack that. And lastly, commission. The church is a collection of people who are committed to fulfilling Jesus' great commission through the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? You got it? Confession, commands, commission. So let's unpack these one at a time. Confession. I said the church is a collection of people who hold to a great confession of the person and work of Jesus Christ. You ha I'm not talking about an ecclesiastical confession, a, um, something you just learn and say in the church or just becoming the member of the church or just not that those things are bad. Hear me. But the confession I'm talking about far supersedes a mere intellectual assent or to just a assent of religious traditions. But listen, the confession I'm talking about is a life-changing commitment to Christ based on an understanding of who he is and what he's done. It's life-changing. Let's look at, uh, we've sung about it today, and thank you, Elena, for leading us, and Myrick, appreciate that. We sang these words in our service today, but let's turn to Matthew 16, verses 13 through 18, or if you'd just like to watch it on the screen, I do have the text for you. Matthew 16, verses 13 through 18. 
It says, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I want to suggest to you that Jesus' question that he asked the disciples, who do people say that I am, is the most important question any person will ever wrestle with, deal with, answer in life. Who is Jesus Christ? Who is he? Notice that the answers were flattering that the people in his day gave, okay? Well, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets, but they were all far deficient. And I think in our own day, we would admit that if we just went out in our neighborhood and asked people around the neighborhood, who, did, who is Jesus? Well, he's a dead religious leader. Oh, he was one of the spiritual leaders, or he taught some good things, or some wouldn't even care, you know. And some would have the right answer, an answer like, Peter, you are the Christ the Son of the living God. You are the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Son of the living God. And Jesus affirmed Peter's answer. He said, blessed are you, Simon, that you know this. And here's an important point. Listen to this. He says, you haven't come to that understanding just in your, in your own human ability. The Father has revealed that to you. That means that a confession that I'm talking about today is a supernatural thing. It's not just a human thing. God speaks to human hearts. He draws people. And if you've truly confessed Christ, you know this, God has been working in your life. If you feel any hunger for God today, if you sense anything in your heart that's drawing you to God, that's God working in your heart. That's not you. That's why it's so important that we don't ignore that when God works in us. Blessed are you, Simon, God has revealed something to you. And that's what this confession is about. This confession, Jesus said, that of a realization of who he is and what he's going to be doing is really what he's going to build his church on. The church is a group of people who have made the profound, listen, life-changing, Holy Spirit-birthed confession about who Jesus is and what he's done. And who is he? He's the eternal Son of God. He stepped out of eternity and took on flesh. He lived a perfect life among us. He offered his perfect, perfect life as a substitutionary sacrifice for me and you. Does this mean anything to you today? God raised him from the dead, validating all his claims of who he was and what he was doing for us on our behalf. And now he offers the gift of eternal life to anyone who will trust in him and make this great confession of who he is and what he's done. He's the head of the church. He's the cornerstone of the church. Paul says in 1 Corinthians that he's the foundation and no other foundation can be laid. No, every church that's a true church has to have the foundation of Jesus Christ and honoring him. Is he your Lord? I believe many of you here have made that confession you probably wouldn't be here. But if you haven't made that confession, maybe you're watching this message later on, this is what the confession is about when Paul wrote these words to the Romans. He said this, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that's acknowledging who he is, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, in other words, validating what he said he was going to do by offering his life for your sins. If you do that, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. 
and I love this, there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. There's no different ethnicities that God is going to give favor toward. It doesn't matter who you are, what race you are, what gender you are, who you are, where you've been. It doesn't matter. God will forgive you. There's no distinction. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches upon all who call on him. See, call on him. Not kind of just attend church, not just go through some class, some confirmation class. That may be sincere, but it just might be the religious tradition you've been brought in. No, but you call upon his name. Oh God, I need you, and I believe Jesus is your son. And I believe he died for me and rose again for me. That's the confession of which you will have a spiritual birth and be born again, and you will become a member of the true church. What is the true church? The church is a collection of people who hold to such a confession as that. Secondly, the second characteristic of the true church is summarized by the word commands. What I mean by that is this, commands. The church is a collection of people who are willing to repent from sin so that they may be obedient to Jesus' commands. Please hear me. We grade our own lives on a curve. We compare ourselves with other people. We say we're not that bad (laughs) compared to what, you know. But listen to what the Bible says in Romans 6, the first four verses. Follow along with me. Paul has just outlined the tremendous grace that God has given us in forgiving us of our sins by faith. And then he says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized or identified into the body of Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, listen to it, we too might walk in newness of life. Our old lives are to die, just symbolized by the death of Christ. And just as God raised Christ to life, we're to live a new life. The church is a collection of people who regularly repent from sin, and by God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit, they walk a different way. They live a different way. There's conviction of sin that this isn't right to do what I'm doing. If it, it, the Spirit who comes and lives with us will tell us that. He will convict us of that. That's why we're told not to quench the Spirit of God. Don't don't put that thought out of your mind when God's trying to tell you something. Hey, listen, you're not in the right place. Repent. Come back to me, and God will meet you. I love, uh, several years ago, Linda and I had the privilege, along with our sons, to go to Africa to visit the hospital that we, uh, the Alliance Church runs in Bangalore, Gabon. And uh, it's quite... A place, but I was very blessed by our brothers and sisters in Christ uh, there in Africa, the, the local African people. And they have a neat way of saying that they've become Christians. They told me when I asked them, you know, what happened to you, and they would, they would get, tell their story, and they'd say, I'm on the Jesus road. I love that. I'm on the Jesus road. I was on my own road. <laughs> I was on my own way of life, own way of living, own way of trying to be right and do the right things, but no, I've left that, and I'm on the Jesus road now. We're to be on a different road. We've been saved by grace. And if anyone puts their, if anyone has become a Christian, a follower of Christ, the Bible says they're new creations. God has done something inside of us. And it says that the old things, the old way of living is supposed to pass away. And new things, a new way of living, is supposed to come. That's the way it is. Mickey Cohen was a gangster uh, who began working for Bugsy Siegel in the Los Angeles underworld in the 1940s. In 1955, there was a much publicized, and I'm old enough to remember this, by the way. No, I I was still two years to be born, but... uh, In 1955, there was a much-publicized account that said Mickey Cohen had become a Christian. 
You see, what had happened is a gambling friend of Mickey's, Bill Jones, had become a Christian, receiving Christ at a Billy Graham crusade. And he began witnessing to Mickey. And Mickey seemed tender toward that, and, and Cohen even prayed a prayer with him to receive Christ. But Mickey continued in the same life of crime. So his friend, Bill Jones, confronted him, and when he did, uh, Mickey Cohen said this, well, there are Christian movie stars, there are Christian athletes, and there's Christian businessmen, so what's the matter with being a Christian gangster? <laughs> if I have to give up all that, if that's Christianity, count me out. Yeah, that's Christianity. If anyone would come after me, Jesus said, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, Mickey Cohen is an extreme example, but I don't want to let myself off the hook here. I have to be willing to repent of anything that displeases the Lord. That's what this thing's about, see? This is what Christianity is about. I have to be willing to repent of things that displease the Lord and live in obedience to Jesus' commands. That's God's will for us. That's what glorifies him. That's his will for the church. We are to walk in the power of the Spirit. We're to walk in a new way. When Jesus was about to give his life, he said this to his disciples just before he was crucified. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. But notice this. He knows that we can't keep his commandments in our own strength. He knows who we are. But look at what he goes on to say. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. In the Greek word, there's different words for the word another. Another of a different kind, another of the same kind. This Greek word means, I will give you another of the same kind as me. God, he's speaking of God the Holy Spirit. To be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and, and will be in you. I will give you the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the time when the church was born on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came into believers permanently indwelling them. And Jesus said he has given us that spirit so that we can be empowered to live a new life. Now, how does this work? Hang in there with me. We are commanded, and by the way, these are commands from God. They're not suggestions. We're commanded to love each other. We're commanded to, to, to love and to serve the Lord. But God knows we need help to do that. And so we are commanded to be filled with the Spirit. What does that mean? Have you heard about that? If somebody says, is that a Spirit-filled person? Or am I, a, am I Spirit-filled? Or is this a spirit-filled church? What are they talking about? What would that look like? Well, Paul uses a very interesting illustration to tell us about it. In Ephesians 5.18, he says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. <laughs> he likens being filled with the Spirit to getting drunk. But if you think about it, it makes sense. What happens to a person if they drink too much? alcohol. The alcohol starts to control them. They start to lose control. They start to act in ways they wouldn't normally act. They say things that they don't normally say. And Paul's saying, don't do that. Don't let the alcohol control you in that way. But yield yourself to the Holy Spirit. And then he'll come and feel. Yield to him. And he will fill you and give you the power to live the way you're supposed to. Can I make this real personal? Uh, Linda can attest to this. I get aggravated driving the car when other, the way other people drive. Yeah. And I'd feel really bad if you were one of them that I was irritated with. You know, that would just, that would not be good. And I'm sure I probably irritate people driving. But if somebody's in the left-hand lane driving too slow, whoa. Whoa, 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 you're not, the left lane is for passing, going faster, what are you doing? Or, the, you know, I'm about six cars back at a left-hand turn arrow, 
and the first car, the arrow goes. Nothing. They don't move. You know there's a big responsibility if you're sitting in the front of a left-hand arrow. That You are under a great responsibility for the guy six cars back who wants to make that light. And I... <laughs> And I get irritated. And I get agitated. But you know what? Every now and then, I get caught on this. And I just called somebody an idiot. And I recognize that's not the Spirit of God. That's Jim. That's who I am. And I need more moments like this. What do you do? Let's flesh this out. In that moment, you can make a choice. You can say, God, please forgive me. I know that attitude's not right. I, I surrender that to you. I yield that to you. Now, come fill me. Fill me. And then I can have his love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I can have those things from God if I'll yield to him. But if I don't, I'll just get a whole dose of Jim. And Jim ain't always so pretty. Friends, we are to walk in newness of life. That's his will, and we're a collection of people. The power of the Holy Spirit can break sinful habits in us. His power can help us overcome racism, pornography, jealousy, pride, negativity, gospel, a critical spirit, or whatever we are powerless to control. The power of the Holy Spirit can help us. That's God's will for us. That's his intent for his church. It's a group of people who are willing to repent of their sins and live for God. That's what he wants. And here's our application. Here's our, this is a football moment, church. This is, this is our moment like that. Jesus said the greatest commandments were this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second command is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So if we don't do those two things, I don't care what you call this place. It's not the church. It's not what he wants for the church. And he would say to you, church, <laughs> love me first and foremost. Put me above everything else in your life. Serve me from your heart. Come, worship me. I want to just thank you for coming today. Thank you for being here to honor the Lord. That's what this is about. It's his honor. It's his glory. He's been good to us. That's why we gather. Keep loving him. And love each other like he wants us to love each other. We, have to, we need his help with this, guys. We just need God's help. I need God's help. And I just put these in here. Uh, I'm going to go through them quickly, but if you want to take a picture of these scriptures here, look, look at these together with me. Do you, if you don't think that, the, that God is serious about us loving one another, this is all through, and I just chose these verses, there's, there's many, many more. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Oh, what if we live that way? Showing honor to one another. Live in harmony with one another. Bear one another's burdens. You know, one of the deepest things I love in the church is in the hardest times of my life, people have come alongside me to bear my, bear my burden. At the death of loved ones, I've had people love on me, care for me, be there for me. That's the church. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. If this wasn't possible to do by the power of the Holy Spirit, why would God tell us to do it? He's not like that. He doesn't tell us to do things that we're unable to do with his help. Encourage one another. Build one another up. Here's some more. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Do not speak evil against one another. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. And then the disciple of Jesus, the beloved disciple, John says, and this is his, God's commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. That's just a sample, folks. And love is not to be in, in word only. It's to be the way we live. We need, the, we need God's help to live this out. 
That's the purpose of the church, though. It's a collection of people who are committed to repenting of sin and following these commands and everything that God has told us to do. Lastly, we're on the home stretch. Thank you for your patience and listening. The last mark of the true church is this. The church is a collection of people who are committed to fulfilling Jesus' great commission also through the power of the Holy Spirit. If you want to answer the question, what is the church, you have to say, and you have to remember, the true church is on mission with God. God is on a mission. He sent his son into this world to seek and to save the lost. That's his mission. He is calling a people from every race and ethnicity from around the globe. He's calling a people out of the world to himself who are going to love and worship him for all eternity, and he's on mission. And everything he's going to do on this earth, he's going to do through his church. That's what he's chosen to do. He's going to do it through the church. He wants us to be his agents. That's why Paul says to the Corinthians, you are ambassadors. We're ambassadors. We're serving the king. We're telling uh, the mission of God. We're, We're taking it to people. After his resurrection, Jesus made this mission totally clear. Just some scriptures I know you're familiar with. Matthew 28 says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. That's the mission. I don't know what our mission is sometimes. I mean, they're important things. We want to have a kids ministry and worship ministry. We want to do... Those things are fine. They have their place. But friends, this is the... This is the primary uh, mission of the church make disciples baptizing them in the name of the father the son the holy spirit teach them look teach them to observe everything i've commanded you do you think obedience to his commands is important teach them to obey these things and behold i am with you always through the power of the holy spirit he said this uh, after his resurrection as the father has sent me even so i am sending you right? We're sent, folks. We're here in west side of Cleveland, but God has planted us here for all the people around here, you know, that need to know him. That's our mission. Somehow we got to, you know, there's a lot of people that aren't here this morning. God would like them here. God would want them to be here, and he wants to use us somehow to reach them. Acts 1.8, but you will receive power You see, it's not in our own strength that we have to do this mission. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. We're in mission with God, empowered by the Holy Spirit. We're to make disciples. We're to pray that God would move. We're to build each other up. We're to have a passion that we would be used of God. Do you ever think about that, God? How, how can you use me in this mission? How am I, can I be used? He wants to use every one of us to reach and to share. Let's never drift away from this commitment to God's great commission, church. Let's keep, keep it before us. I know we've been through a lot. This church has been through a lot. But God is faithful, and he will help us as we remain faithful to him. I close with this uh, illustration how many times do I say I'm going to close? That's another thing preachers do. Does that irritate you? And in closing, and then they, they have 16 more points after that, right? This really is the end. But I, I'm deeply moved by this story, and it, it's never far from my heart. One of the pastors that I do like to listen to and listen to his preaching is uh, Jim Simbola from the Brooklyn Tabernacle in New York. I had the privilege of going to a music conference there several years ago and just participating in that, being part of their services, and I've appreciated his heart. But he tells this uh, story that uh, of one uh, particular Easter Sunday, they'd had multiple services, so maybe three or four services, and their service lengths are two, two and a half hours. So it was at the very end of the very last service, the closing song, They were singing, and this disheveled-looking man started walking down the aisle toward him. And Jim Cimbala said his first thought, honestly, he was tired. His first thought was, oh, great. 
This is how we're going to end our Easter service. Somebody hitting me up for some money. The man had a filthy hat, worn out clothing, matted hair. Pastor Symbol would later find out he was only 31 years old, but he looked like he was in his 50s. And when he got close to uh, Pastor Symbola, he said the smell of this man was overwhelming. It was a mixture of feces and urine and sweat, alcohol. Pastor Symbola said, I actually had to look away to inhale and then turn back to him. So Pastor Symbola said, I, I took my wallet out, handed him some money, took out some money, started to hand it to David. And David pushed the money away. He said, I don't want your money. I'm dying out there. I want this Jesus you've been talking about. And in that moment, Pastor Simba said something broke in him. Something broke. Now here's a pastor of the Brooklyn Tavern Echo Choir who's just preached on the power of Jesus, who Jesus is. But he said in that moment, something broke in him and he started to be convicted over his own lack of love. And he actually prayed to himself in that moment, oh God, please forgive me. What have I become? You send me someone who is seeking you and I want to give him a few dollars and send them away. Oh God, please forgive me. Please forgive me. He says when he prayed that prayer to God, a fresh love came into his, over him and he embraced David. And David put his arms around Jim Cimbala and they both cried together. A preacher who is in need of God and a homeless man who was in need of God. They were the same. They cried together, and there was a fresh outpouring and of God's love, and Jim explained to him that he could have a new life, that Christ could help him and forgive him. And that day, David became a follower of Jesus Christ. Sincerely from his heart, he cried out to God, God, please save me. And he believed in what Jesus had done and asked him for a new life. You know, Pastor Simbla says that as he was reflecting on that later in the day, what had happened, he said he had sensed that God was speaking to him in his heart these things. He said, you see that smell? If you don't love that smell, I can never use you. Because the whole world smells that way to me. All the filthy, stinking sin of mankind. I sent my son to die for that smell. So you either have to embrace that smell and love people in my name, or I can't use you. Well, the church helped David through detox and uh, eventually hired him on their facilities team at the church. And today, he's walking a new life. And he's a man of God. Friends, there's something bigger going on here. God has a, a, a will for us in the church. And I don't know how this would speak to you, but I just pray that you'll wrestle with these thoughts. Confession, commands, commission. And kind of this week, think about those things. Bring them before the Lord and what God wants from you in your life. And maybe even in these moments, maybe the Spirit is speaking to you about some things you want to change or things that He wants to help you change in your life. Man, don't resist Him. Don't resist Him. Today, the, the Bible says, if you hear His voice, do not harden your heart. This is, we can receive from God, all of us. I just want to spend a few moments in prayer. So would you just pray with me? Father, I thank you for 
making it very clear what your church is to be. I ask forgiveness for myself and just for ways that sometimes I get off track. I get devoted to other things or I, I prioritize other things. I make major things minor and minor things major. I'm sorry, Lord, and I, I pray that you will help all of us, help this church family to hold to their confession about who you are and what you have done to be a, a family of believers who are willing to repent. Forgive us, Lord, for always thinking it's somebody else who has to repent. You tried to tell us about that. You said that we sometimes try to take a speck out of one of our brother or sister's eyes when we have a log in our own eye. Would you forgive us? Would you help us who have known a lot of truths about you to actually live them out? It's not those who hear the word of God that are set free, but those who hear it and do it. They're the ones that, that you're pleased with. May your spirit bring to our minds anything that's not pleasing to you and give us the humility to be able to walk with you closely and or even the ability to maybe go to someone and say, I, I'm sorry, would you forgive me? Lord, help us to love the way you want us to love. Help us to love you first and foremost and to love one another deeply from our hearts. And keep, this, keep us all on mission with you. Keep us on mission with you, Lord. And... Uh, Show us as this church moves forward and no matter what changes take place and God, you remain the same even as we were led in song today. You're faithful no matter what. So we give you thanks for that. Encourage these people and help them in the days ahead. And let us live for you and be the church that you want us to be, so that you can build your church. You're not going to build our church. You're not going to build our little kingdom. The church is bigger than any leader, uh, any group of people. Lord, the church belongs to you. Help us to submit to you, and then you build your church the way you want to build it. Thank you for these moments together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, everyone. Thank you for listening, and just before we close our service, uh, we're going to invite Mike and Wendy are going to come. They want to share something with you. But thank you so much for being here today. Mike, Wendy. Thanks, Jim. Oh, I'll try not to. In the sweet spot. There we go. Back. <laughs> Hi, church family. So Mike and I just wanted to um, there. We're good. Um, we just wanted to share um, an update with you all. Um, over the last couple of months, as Mike and I have been seeking the Lord. Um, together as a family, um, God has made it clear to us that um, we have completed our time at Westside, and I'll be stepping down from my position on staff. Um, this has not been an easy decision to make, and I want you all to know that um, it has been through much prayer and wrestling with the Lord um, that he has made us clear to this and led us to this decision. Um, but our final Sunday with you all will be on January 30th, the end of this month. Um, we did want to say we are both just so thankful for our time here, for the relationships that have been built here. Um, it has meant a lot to us. Um, many of you feel like family to us, and we do want you to know we do not plan to be strangers. We are not moving. Um, we'll be staying here in Cleveland and seeking the Lord for what's next. And we would love to also connect with you all over the next few weeks as we are um, still here as well. Um, but as I was reflecting and praying this morning, 
Um, I came across this blessing in Ephesians that I wanted to um, leave you all with, a prayer that Paul prayed for the church in Ephesus, and I just wanted to um, read this, and then um, Dan will come up to to share a little bit for us. Um, So I'm going to read Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. And it says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So thank you. Here, I'll invite up Dan. Okay. Thank you, Mike and Wendy, for sharing your hearts with us. Um, I did want to say, church family, that we will be having just a time of prayer for Mike and Wendy um, in two weeks on Sunday morning. And we are going to be taking some time to um, extend blessing to them um, and just remind ourselves of God's goodness. And I will just say right now, it's been an incredible privilege to um, not just be friends with Mike and Wendy, but also to serve on staff here with them as they have both shepherded, shepherded and led Um, adults um, through Empower, Wendy, and Soul Care, and um, the children upstairs, and leading the team of teachers, and Mike and Wendy leading us uh, before God in song and in praise to him, and uh, and doing that really well. Um, So I will leave it at that right now, but I'm just very thankful for Mike and Wendy and grateful to God that um, he has brought them here uh, for the time that he's brought them here. And um, so I just want to affirm that. And then also, along with that, that the Gearhearts did not state, but uh, it goes along with that, that Keegan will also not be here with us. And just affirm our thankfulness to Keegan and her presence with us. And just the way that she is served um, and uh, just her spirit, her joyful spirit every time I've talked to her. Um, But we'll have some time, and I hope that you all will take time to talk with Mike and Wendy, ask some questions, uh, get get to hear a little bit more of the journey that God's led them in and and, uh, what he's doing in their lives. Um, after the service today, in the coming weeks, as Wendy said, um, feel free to do that. Um, but I just wanted to close, and um, Elena and Myrick, can you guys come up and be prepared to sing uh, another song um, in closing? But as they come up, I just wanted to affirm God's plans and we don't always, we're not always prepared for how he works, um, but um, he does lead in different ways in each of our lives. We're not always prepared for it, but um, we just affirm that God's ways are good, and he's a faithful God, and um, I, the Spirit was leading me to this passage in Philippians, and I just want to read it, Philippians 2. Um, verse 1 through 4 says, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete 
who talks like that anymore. Make my joy complete by doing so. Make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And this was the attitude of Christ, of course, towards us um, as he was dying on the cross. Um, doing something for our sake, even though it wasn't the easy path. It wasn't just the simple thing to do. Um, but that's what love really is. And uh, I was just reminded that, you know, as we are preparing for Mike and Wendy to not be with us and Cole and Ivy to be running around um, and Keegan, um, just remind ourselves that God's heart is that he has purposes and he has plans for each of us and for others and for us not to just be thinking, woe is me. Um, of course, grieving is good. We definitely want to embrace that and all that God has for us in grieving and losses. But also let's be thinking about each other and how we can build one another up. And um, so I will leave leave it at that, uh, and let's just pray together um, before Elaine and Myrick lead us in song. So, Heavenly Father, we acknowledge your goodness in our lives, and we acknowledge um, the gift that Mike and Wendy's family has been to us and our, and our church family and, uh, and friendships and in the many ways you've used them to build this church family up in obedience to you. Um, so we give thanks, Lord, and we ask that you would provide many opportunities uh, for connection and for just remembering your goodness in the next couple of weeks. And as we sing this song, um, remind us, Lord, that you're faithful and good. In Jesus' name, amen. Never fails me. Stand if you'd like. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my sing of 
the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. The Lord be with you as you leave this place today.